How we live in and organize our cities is going to be critical to a successful future. Ken Yang, an architect and ecologist, has big ideas on how skyscrapers of the future might look. I believe that biology is the biggest source of ideas, the biggest source of invention. You know, nobody can invent better than nature. And so if you like nature, it's my biggest source of inspiration. My contention is that 80% of the impact of the building is caused by its design. So if we can anticipate the impact at the design stage, we can reduce the, the impact from 80% to, you know, if we can, minimal. I think it's the single most pressing issue that all designers must address today. Otherwise, this millennium will be our last. The ecologist has a much more comprehensive and holistic view of the world. Uh, we're looking at the natural environment as well as the human built environment and the connectivity between the two. That means when we design a building, we're not looking at it as an object, but we're looking at it and its relationship with the natural environment. I call this process of imitation eco-mimesis, imitating the processes in nature. Another aspect that we should imitate is that in nature, the only source of energy is from the sun. Everything comes from the sun through the process of photosynthesis. Whereas now, our source of energy is from fossil fuels, so until we are able to, to operate and run by imitating photosynthesis, it will be a long while before we can have a truly ecological system. In the Edith Tower, what we're trying to do is to interpret as many of our ecological ideas as possible into this single building project. First thing we did was to try and balance the inorganic mass of the tower with more organic mass, which means bringing vegetation and landscaping into the building. We wanted it to be low energy, so we had photovoltaics on its facades, particularly facing the east and west side, and on its roof, so that in this way it would have its own energy source. So we had sun shades, which were scallop shaped, so that we could collect rainwater. And then the building has its own sort of water filtration system, so the water is recycled within the building, and then the sewage are recycled. And so in many ways, it is, if you like, a human-made ecosystem, but in a tower form. Within the next five to ten years, we'll see a lot more green buildings being built. Not just buildings, but green cities, green environment, green master plans, green products, green transportation. Reduced use of cars and, and better use of public transportation affects the planning of cities. And so planners all over the world are aware of this, but some are in a better position to implement it than others. I believe that if we are committed towards it, and that we continue to educate people and get the whole world community to implement green features and aspects, not just in their lifestyles, but in their businesses, in their industries, then we're heading towards a green future. So my dream you know, for the future is that it's a green dream, but as you know, Kermit the Frog says, it's not easy being green, but we should try and make it as green as possible. And I'm very optimistic. In the future, as more and more of us will be living in cities, the design of those cities should learn from nature to maximize efficiency. Everything around us is therefore open to new interpretation. We're going to see a big physical change in our uh, collective environment worldwide. We have to because of the issues of sustainability and efficiency. So efficiency will drive everything. It will drive materials, it will drive form, it will drive ideas, efficiency will be the big one. And efficiency exists in science and biology and all of that, but it also needs to exist in design without being dried out and boring. My Solar Tree project has been a collaboration with the MAC, the Museum Anger van der Kunst in Vienna, a good example of how everyday objects in our surroundings are open to reinterpretation for the future. When we were setting up the tree outside, it was quite wonderful. We had a time-lapse camera out on the street, and it proved its point that modern technology and design can really lift the spirits. Because it's out of context, it's something newborn and fresh, something people have never seen before. It's wildly different than anything else you might see around you, next to the classical architecture of the Mac itself. The intention is ultimately to line them up as a boulevard of trees and to displace all of those ugly retro anonymous lamps that really don't mean anything. They deliver light, but they, that's all they deliver. Here we are, we're trying to deliver something which is a joy, a joy of life. It, it has a sense of biomimicry. A solar tree like this is super efficient. You have an array of 10 panels, basically four illuminated, and the rest of them are there to 
absorb energy and it's funded back down to the battery in the base which then illuminates the tree at night. What's beautiful is you can generate more energy than is required here and maybe you can sell that back to the grid. Maybe the next generation we can put seats around it, we can do plug-ins so you can recharge your phone or look at the internet. What's fantastic here at the Mac, it's basically an example of what happens when you break down borders between art, industry, design, culture, urbanism, life, and time. There's a new platform for change. There's a new change in everything. Science and new ways of thinking about materials at an atomic level like nano uh, are really helping fuel a revolution. So I think what'll happen maybe in the next 15 years or so is we'll see a blending of ideas between new solar and new energy systems into everyday objects where you've got to make everything go a bit further, go a bit better, go the distance in terms of what they can deliver back to us. How the dynamics of the city will change, how people move through a city, for example, and how people view a city, how those people are viewed, the people who just get out of bed every day and got to do a job. I want their lives to change in a really beautiful way. If you can't afford a big Mercedes, maybe you can jump in my bubble car and still feel cool. I mean, why not? We often debate who's going to make this change, who's going to instigate this change. I think people need to be less passive, though I think they need to voice their opinions more. What is wonderful now about the time in which we live, because of the way we communicate now through the internet, maybe those big changes will not come from corporations. Maybe the future is in the hands of individuals. So, with revolution in the air, in so many different aspects of our lives, there are such exciting possibilities. In order for any of this to become reality, there will need to be another major revolution, and that will be in the way we think. We will have to take brave steps. But if we can only make that leap, the future could be here sooner than we imagine. If people are given the opportunity to really make a difference in their own lives and in their own communities and in their own businesses and in their own governments, that we can, in fact, really transform the prospects of life on this planet and find ourselves living in a world that is actually more like the world that I think most of us want to be living in. And I think that's something worth hoping for.